Hi everybody, this is Brendan Baylod. Uh, many of you know me from the uh, Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group. Um, one of the things that I uh, have been doing is uh, putting up some short videos describing some of the things that are uh, particularly useful, the resources that are particularly useful to Great Lakes maritime historians and researchers, particularly those interested in shipwrecks on the Great Lakes. Um, one of the things that I would like to cover today is probably the most useful online database for vessels that is uh, out there right now. And it's a fairly new resource. So um, relatively few people are, are familiar with it. It's one of the three or four major um, Great Lakes Maritime research databases that are on the internet. The others being the, the, the C. Patrick Labadee database uh, hosted by the Alpena Public Library. Uh, and then uh, Walter Lewis's Maritime History of the Great Lakes uh, website and uh, content, and uh, the Historical Collections of the Great Lakes at Bowling Green State University also has a fairly good database. But the largest and most interesting and complete by far is probably the Jerry Metzler Great Lakes Vessel Database, which you see here. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on it. Uh, Jerry Metzler is a, a retired high school teacher from uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And um, I worked with Jerry pretty extensively on arranging for the donation of his collection and of his database uh, to an appropriate uh, repository on the Great Lakes. Jerry is really an exceptional guy. He, he This is his life's work. He basically uh, <clears throat> spent, oh gosh, probably 30 years of his life collecting um, Great Lakes Vessel information and transcribing it into a database. And he used FileMaker Pro for it. He had an entry for every vessel. He went through uh, a number of different sources to do this. The principal among them were the Great Lakes Vessel Enrollment documents from the customs houses on the Great Lakes. He's not the first person to do that. But one of the things that sets his data apart is he also used the Great Lakes Vessel um, master abstracts of enrollments. And I'll explain a little bit about why that's important. When a vessel uh, was built uh, on the Great Lakes, it had to be enrolled at a customs house, and they gave it an enrollment certificate. And any time she changed masters or uh, rig or ports or owners, they'd had to re-enroll re the vessel. She'd get a new enrollment certificate. Now, a good number of those enrollment certificates have been preserved. And for the record, this is a great simplification. People like Chuck Feltner uh, have done really in-depth presentations on this, but I'm keeping it at a high level. Um, a lot of those enrollment certificates weren't preserved um, for various reasons. But we know about them because any time a certificate was issued, they'd also record it in a, in a, in a ledger, uh, and usually just one, one, one row per enrollment certificate. And um, we have those, and so we know, even though we don't have the original certificate that gave the vessel's dimensions and, um, you know, if she had a, a scroll, stem, or what have you, we do know that the paper was issued. We know when it was issued, we know when it was surrendered. So Jerry, in addition to using the certificates, he also used the, the master abstracts. But then he went one further. He also did extensive newspaper microfilm research, where he went and uh, traced the final disposition of nearly every one of these vessels wherever he could. Now, another interesting thing about Jerry's database that you don't find in other databases is he was a real student, uh, I should say is a real student, of the early vessels on the Great Lakes that predate the American period. And so he also has all of the British vessels and all of the early French vessels that we know about in this database. Um, the only downside, I suppose, is that after about 1900, the database falls off uh, very dramatically because that was not Jerry's area of interest. And frankly, we have other resources that are much better. I think the uh, collection at uh, Bowling Green State University, uh, Historical Collections of the Great Lakes, does a much better job after 1900 yeah, with their database. So I'm going to give you a little tour of the Metzler database, and I'm going to explain how to use it and what's out there and, and kind of what it's particularly useful for. And in conjunction with the other databases, this is really an amazing resource. So it has an advanced search uh, feature, which is down here if you click the advanced search button. You can see the URL, it's greatlakesvessels.org. Um, before we go in, I should probably say um, that this is hosted by the Wisconsin Maritime Museum, which may seem odd for a researcher from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I'll explain about that a little bit. Uh, when Jerry was looking for a home for the database, um, 
we were looking, uh, and I was helping him, we were specifically looking for a place that had a pretty good financial endowment and that was likely to be around in 50 years or 100 years. And what most of you know is that, um, you know, the generation that's interested in this stuff is rapidly dying off. So we were concerned about uh, finding museums that are going to be there for the long run and that had the wherewithal and the technical ability to host the database. And that was one of the reasons why we chose the Wisconsin Maritime Museum. Um, it's a long-standing museum. It's uh, well-funded, and uh, they're very interested in Great Lakes vessels and shipwrecks. And so it was right in line with their mission. So um, a, a really uh, good thing that uh, the Wisconsin Maritime Museum did to host Jerry Metzler's data. Well, let's start off. So there are about 15,000 vessel entries in here. Um, and that really is about how many vessels, uh, U.S. and Canadian, there were on the lakes prior to around 1900. Um, there, uh, Jerry also went through the Canadian enrollment documents when he did this database. So let's start off by just showing you uh, an interesting vessel. Uh, I'll come up with one randomly. And this is right off the top of my head. We're going to do the Rainbow. She's a schooner, I think the first built, maybe at Manitowoc, now that I think of it. And there may be others by that name, but let's see. So we enter Rainbow, and we're not going to put any other criteria. Let's see what we come up with. My internet connection cooperates. All right. So what, you, what you'll come up with here is a listing of all the different vessels that Jerry ever found that had rainbow in the name. You can limit that further if you wanted to say whether it's a schooner or any of these other types of vessels. You, if you know the year built or the place built, you can also do it. The builder, obviously the official number of the of the vessel, U.S. or Canadian, uh, launch date, owners, major events. This is really uh, useful. I'll show you this in a little bit. Um, so let's take a look at uh, Sheboygan. Yeah, that's right. She was built at Sheboygan, not at Manitowoc. The first rainbow, the first the first vessel built at Sheboygan. So we click on view. And we have the basic information about the vessel up here that Jerry has from the enrollment documents. Obviously, she's wooden, two-masted, uh, built in 1844 at Sheboygan with a plain head according to enrollments. What we see is that the Rainbow only had one enrollment paper. She was uh, enrolled uh, May 2nd, 1845 at the Port of Detroit. Uh, PE, I believe that's uh, permanent enrollment. That's the type of certificate he recorded this from. Reason for issuance was new vessel, and this was number 30, row number 30 in the, the Master Abstract book. She was 117 and 10 95ths gross tons. That's an interesting thing. Most people would express this as 117.10, but for various reasons, and I won't go into them now, the Customs House has used uh, fractions of 95ths. <laughs> Um, so what do we know about her? Well, from her enrollment paper, we know she was 87 feet long, 22 feet wide, and uh, 6 foot 10 deep, uh, and that's according to the year 1844. We also know from her paper that she was uh, captained by a master named John Thomas, and that she was owned by David Wilson. Um, and uh, obviously she was enrolled out of Detroit, so um, we can assume that... Uh, she was owned out of Detroit, despite being built at Sheboygan. Um, and then he found also that she was ashore in uh, October 19th, 1846 at Lake Erie. And that's his major event that he lists. And he lists his references. So that'll give you a good basic layout of what the records look like in that database. Let's go ahead and look at some others, though, that may have a little bit more interesting information. Um, here's a long-lived schooner called the Rainbow that uh, was out of, built at Buffalo, New York. And this, I happen to know, is a, a, a more uh, well-known vessel with a longer career. Um, this vessel uh, survived until 1867. And because of that, she has a, a, an American official number. Um, for those of you that aren't deeply acquainted with maritime records of Great Lakes vessels, uh, beginning in about, 19, about 1865 to 1867, um, there was a new act for how vessels were to be recorded, and every vessel got an official number. This helped clear up the very large number of vessels named Mary and Union and 
you know, Elizabeth, <laughs> um, that oftentimes were very similar in size and build year. And so by giving them an official number, you would know um, which particular Mary you were dealing with. So let's take a look at what uh, the kind of data uh, Jerry has here. He knows from the enrollment certificate that she had a scroll head, which is kind of cool. We don't see a lot of that on later vessels, but in the 1840s, 50s, and right up into the 60s, you saw a lot of figureheads, scroll heads, just beautiful kind of wooden wood artwork underneath the bowsprit on these vessels. Jerry notes she was rebuilt in 1887. So let's walk through enrollments. This is fairly, fairly typical, actually, of a Great Lakes vessel to really have gone through a lot of different papers. And I won't walk you through them exhaustively, but what we see is that her first paper was issued as a new vessel on September 1st, 1855. I use this data a lot because I like to find launch articles. So I'll go back to the Buffalo papers in, on newspapers.com. And I know that she was enrolled 9155, right? And because of that, I can uh, say that, well, she probably was launched in August of 1855. And I can check the August 1855 newspapers to find her launch article. And that's usually pretty cool because it'll talk about who she was built for. And they usually use a lot of flowery language, which is kind of cool if you're an author and you want to reprint that. So what happened? She was sold many times, obviously, mostly out of Detroit. But then she came to Chicago. She was readmeasured. Now, why do they do that? What does that mean? That means that they remeasured the vessel's dimensions and tonnage. And they usually do that if the vessel has had some sort of rebuild activity that would change that. And sometimes even a re-rigging, like changing from uh, a brig rig to a schooner rig can do that because it changes the amount of usable deck space. Um, so then she came to Milwaukee, we can see here in around uh, 65 at the end of the Civil War, and she had a long career out of Milwaukee. And we can see that way down here, they say rig change to schooner. So, boy, that's pretty late. I find it hard to believe that she was anything other than a, than a schooner. So I'm not sure why we, we, we have this rig change to schooner, unless she had been a barge and they put her back to being a top topsail schooner. Um, but we see that um, this paper here was, and the way to read this, this is important. Um, on 10-26-87, her rig was changed to schooner. This paper was surrendered at Milwaukee on June 30th, 1894, annotated vessel lost. So this rainbow was lost sometime in June of 1894, or at least they surrendered the paper then. We can take a look and see exactly what happened in Jerry's notes. Down here, we see that, remember, she was rebuilt, re measured in 65. So we have a completely different measurement here. So you might ask, why is this one so much more than this one when her size didn't change? One of the things that happened in 1865, 6, 7, when they passed that um, uh, law about the, the granting the official numbers, um, they also created the annual list of U.S. merchant vessels, which uh, you know you can use as a reference. Uh, and Jerry does reference a little bit here. But um, they also changed how they measured tonnage. When you see one of these old 95th measures from pre-1865, it's called BO, it's also, sometimes you'll say BOM after it. The researchers will note that. Builder's Old Measure was the name of that. And it consistently overestimated the tonnage of vessels. And, and the reason it did that is because it kind of calculated the, 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 the capacity of the schooner or, or vessel as though it was a, a, a Kleenex box, you know, or a shoe box. It would uh, uh, length by uh, by beam by depth. And uh, and then, of course, they tried to correct it, I think, by doing it as 95ths, which uh, didn't help. The new me method um, measured it differently. It uh, took into account only usable space. It did not use consider the vessel to be square. And so every vessel that on the lakes, when it was re-measured due to the act, uh, had its tonnage decreased. So that can be confusing when you see an older vessel and it's got two tonnages and you're, some people are, get confused and think, well, it, might, it could be a different ship because it's so much smaller. No, um, it's because it was re-measured. So that's something to keep in mind. All right, let's move down. Dimensions changed a little bit, but not much. So 
you know, what happened here? Why was it 127 feet? Why was it 28.2? And why did they come up with 20, 125 and 20, 27 10 years later? Uh, did they, you know, cut two feet out of the vessel? Did they you know, cut her bow off? No. Um, this is just a read measurement difference in, you know, what the finding was when they measured her. You see these kind of variances. So when people are trying to identify a shipwreck hull and they're getting a two foot difference in length and they're like, oh, it can't be the so-and-so because it's two feet shorter. Well, that's not always the case. Uh, the, the vessel's length varied with age. Sometimes the hull settled a little bit. She could get a foot longer. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Um, and, uh, or, you know, or she opened up a little or they measured her a little bit different differently. Um, uh, sometimes the gunnels, you know, on the side of the vessel were moved, were moved outward a little bit to give her more deck space. You know, a lot of different things could happen. So keep in mind, this vessel was not reconstructed. This is just, you know, minor changes. Um, so let's talk about the other things that Jerry has that, frankly, you don't find in other databases. He lists who all the masters and owners were on all the papers. Now, he only has these, generally speaking, particularly the masters, if there was an enrollment certificate. Uh, there's The masters aren't always listed on the, I think they're actually on the master abstracts now that I think about it. Um, anyway, what you see here is uh, all the names of these people. And it's kind of cool because you can see sort of who the owners were and who the masters were. And you can look these people up on genealogical databases like Ancestry.com. And you can see who they were and what trades were they in and who their families were. A lot of these people were prominent early settlers, you know. Uh, H.N. Strong, for example. In fact, I think there's a schooner named after him. Very prominent, uh, I think a grain merchant, uh, if I remember correctly. Sometimes you see some, you know, Jerry wrote things down as he thought he saw them. So he has J.R. Slanson here. Well, that's probably not true. That's Slauson, very, very well-known uh, ship-owning family. And then the next year he has J.P. Slauson. <laughs> um, this is the same person, J.P., J.R., you know, he's writing down what he thinks he sees. And you see this a lot. He didn't go, he didn't, he didn't try to correct the data because, and I respect him for that, because he had to write down what he thought he saw. If you start to try to correct it and you get it wrong, you're even further obfuscating the historical record. So that's why he did that. Just so you know, when you see a name that's obviously the same person, you know, so why do you have the same owner two years in a, two, two diff, on two different papers? Because she, the owner didn't change here. She was just read measured, but he recorded the name from every paper. So then let's look at the, um, the major events. These are all the different accidents that this vessel was ever recorded in. And of course, at the end, she was a victim of the great gales of uh, May 1894 at Chicago. Um, she collided with the schooner Myrtle. And I have a very good woodcut engraving showing uh, the carnage from this storm, very famous storm at Chicago that she was lost in. But what you see here are the accidents from all the accident lists. And, and for those of you who, who don't know about accident lists, uh, there are many different organizations that, that recorded every minor disaster on the lakes uh, from about 1840 right up until uh, about 1900. So every year there were thousands of minor collisions, groundings, strandings. And we have record of every, every one of those. Uh, the Board of Lake Underwriters, the early insurance consortium on the lakes, recorded all of those accidents. And then later, the uh, Weather Bureau lists by the Chief Signal Officer recorded all those accidents. Marine reporters like Captain J.W. Hall published annual uh, lists uh, of all the accidents on the Great Lakes. And then, of course, the newspapers often published a season synopsis, usually in December or January, listing all of the accidents on the lakes. And they often took a full page of the paper. Um, so um, we see, for example, that in August of 1869, a, a man fell from the masthead, breaking his leg. That's, that's incredible that he lived. <laughs> and didn't just break, break a leg. But in any event, you get the kind of data that we have. And then, of course, he lists uh, his sources. So one of the things you'll see is that you know he lists the newspaper where he found the accidents also this marine casualties on the great lake 63 to 73 very important reference that you see a lot um beginning in 1863 all the customs houses on the great lakes started to collect casualty reports or wreck reports when a vessel had any kind of accident 
And in, in that 10 year period, they didn't save the reports. What they, all we have is a master abstract ledger of every wreck that was reported. And it's really extensive. It's got thousands of accidents in it. I, I have a, a copy of it. It's on microfilm at the National Archives, and it just it's handwritten, hard to read. But then beginning in 1873, the actual wreck reports are preserved at the National Archives. They've never been microfilmed. We actually have a project to do that that we're starting. But so these wreck reports are really important documents for understanding what happened to these ships. Um, I'll go into one little thing here, too, about this and say, what's important about these, these different accidents? Well... Um, it's not so much that the, the ship, you know, tangled its mast or something. It's that we often, in many cases, know what cargoes they were carrying. We can see what lakes they were on when the accident happened. Like, we know this ship was on the St. Clair River. We know she was at Milwaukee. We know she was on Lake Erie. We know she was on Lake Ontario. It tells us a lot. And if you look at these original accidents, a lot of them contain the cargoes that the vessel was carrying at the time of the accident. And that tells us what trades she was in. So we know, for example, that if this vessel had been carrying grain earlier in her career, uh, and then we see she was carrying lumber, uh, we know that she had probably had her hull class down. It was probably starting to get a little long in the tooth. You wouldn't take a vessel that could that was rated A1 or A2 and, and carry lumber with it. It is much more profitable to run it in the grain trade. But then once she could no longer... Uh, carry grain because her, her, her hull rating with the Board of Lake Underwriters had fallen below A2, you know, say into the B1, B2, or even C category, then the vessel uh, was relegated to the um, the lumber trades, or maybe if she was B1, she might be relegated to the iron, iron ore trade, you know. But a vessel rated, say, C probably would be in the lumber or, you know, um, stone trade potentially uh carrying iron ore required a pretty staunch haul still so um let's look down here a little bit we see this captain jw hall marine disasters on the western lakes this was actually a bound uh thing that the Cap captain hall put out uh i think 69 68 69 i think there's one in 73 too I mean, another in 78 bound books they're really rare um, we have copies of them that are digitized. And then, of course, the annual list of U.S. merchant vessels, um, which um, Jerry referenced. So really, and he did this, I mean, this is just one vessel, right? If we looked at other vessels in here, uh, we could see just an amazing amount of information. Um, let's take a look at um, a really early um, vessel, if we can, and see what we get for that. Um, let's look at, see what he has for the Felicity, the British vessel. Here she is. She was a sloop built in 1774 at Detroit. He knew she had a plane head. Interesting. He must have checked her build records. He knew her dimensions. Uh, this is a very important vessel. She was the first decked vessel ever to uh, call it Milwaukee. He lists her armament. Uh, he lists all her, her sources. He consulted uh, Mansfield's History of the Great Lakes, Cuthbertson's Freshwater, the Michigan Pioneer and Historical Collections. So this will give you an idea. He, and the Wisconsin Historical Collections. So uh, Telescope from uh, uh, the Detroit Marine Historical Society. Just a lot of, of stuff. So very good research here on early vessels. Um, Let's try, uh, let's try a big steamer. Let's see what we, he knows about the Lady Elgin. And it's interesting, there are other vessels named Lady Elgin, obviously. Uh, the one we want is the Buffalo Built one by uh, Bidwell and Banta. All right. And you can see she uh, didn't change owners too often, uh, but he's got her... Uh, her surrender here her read measurement because she uh well so she was read measured twice uh looks to me like there was a rebuild at the last read measurement um so her 1860 paper shows her as being smaller that's probably because there were some configuration changes with her uh cargo spaces uh her dimensions changed a little bit but obviously 
uh, I see. She went from a depth of 13 to 11.7, and that's because they changed her cargo space configuration. They, it doesn't mean they changed her hull. We've got her, uh, her captains, we've got her owners, and we've got her major events. Now, there are many more than this. Uh, one of the things that... There are other uh, accident lists that Jerry doesn't have in here. Uh, she probably was involved in two dozen minor accidents, but you know some of them are so minor they barely mention are worth mentioning. Um, he's got some information about her engines in here. Uh, the one of the things that Jerry doesn't do that uh, Labity does. Labity in his database at Alpina is much more interested in steam vessels. He's got all the engine data he could dig up. Whereas Jerry is more interested in the career of the vessel, the owners, the masters. So I think I'm going to uh, start to wind down here with this. Um, it is uh, uh, just an exceptional, exceptional database. I will show you one other thing we can do. I think this will be useful. If you want to know about the accidents at a given place, you can, he, he, remember, he has all the accidents in the events data. So say you want to know about any vessel that had a mishap at Sackett's Harbor. Well, let's not say Sackett's because that's an odd spelling. It can have one T or two depending upon the era. Um, let's do uh, I know a good one. Let's do Kenosha. You can't mess that one up very much. All right. So what you're going to get if you enter that in is you're going to get every vessel. We have 54 listings that got herself into trouble uh, or was built at Kenosha. Let's take a look at the Edna. This is one of my favorites, only because I've looked for her. <laughs> built in 1887. Uh, vessel was lost. Uh, her enrollment was surrendered at Chicago in 88. And... Uh, a year after she was lost, actually. And what he says is uh, she sank uh, October 26, 87, which is very true. The life-saving service took two men off of her. She was carrying stone, and she went down in about 50 feet of water, and we've never found her, despite looking. There's probably a keel and ribs out there, but it's probably, you know, fairly buried by a pile of stone. Um, so this is a good example of how to look for accidents at a given port. Um, and every one of these vessels, you know, had some sort of mishap. Um, the George Hansen, another good example. She's another little vessel that went down off Kenosha that we're still looking for, um, and, uh, capsized and wrecked. Uh, we have news accounts of this that are much more detailed, but so anyway, you can use, uh, the Metzler database to come up with fairly detailed, um, uh, lists. You would have to go through every one of these. Not every one of these was a total loss, obviously. Uh, some of them are, but, but they're all interesting. So that is the Metzler database. Um, it is a really important resource, probably the most important resource for 19th century vessels uh, in existence. Um, it's quite good. Uh, a little more complete in some eras than Labadee's database. Uh, I would say a lot more complete for early vessels. Uh, because it's it's really good for the early vessels, you know, 1810, 1820, 1830, uh, about which otherwise fairly little is known. So I hope you enjoyed this review of the uh, Jerry Metzler database and uh, and that you make use of it. Uh, it's really an important resource and uh, one that I've really gotten a lot of mileage out of. I probably will do some future uh, things on other databases and... Uh, uh, show you sort of the ins and outs of them and uh, different ways to use them. So any questions, feel free to uh, drop me an email. Um, I can be reached uh, through through email at brendan at bailout.com or you can just uh, IM me on, uh, on the Great Lake Shipwreck Research Group. So thank you everybody for, uh, for watching.